Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World is brought to you by the Star Quest Production Network and is made possible by our many generous patrons. If you'd like to support the podcast, please visit sqpn.com slash give. You're listening to episode 329 of Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World, where we look at mysteries from the twin perspectives of faith and reason. In this episode, we're talking about the Zodiac Killer and the crimes he committed. I'm Dom Bettinelli, and joining me today is Jimmy Aiken. Hey, Jimmy. Howdy, Dom. Beginning in late 1968, a serial killer began terrorizing the San Francisco Bay Area. He called himself the Zodiac. In addition to killing people, he carried on an extensive correspondence with various newspapers and individuals. He sent taunting letters and cards that dared the police to catch him. He issued threats that terrified the community, and he sent cryptograms that, when decoded, described a bizarre set of beliefs. This all made the Zodiac arguably the most famous solo serial killer in American history. But what motivated him? Why did he commit his bizarre crimes, and who was the Zodiac? That's what we'll be talking about on this episode of Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World. Jimmy, why did you want to do this mystery? Well, I've actually wanted to do it for a long time. In fact, I had partial drafts of this week's and next week's scripts sitting on my hard drive for years. When I pulled them out to finish them up, I realized how old they were. They date from 2021, and they're so old that they were written well before we hit episode 200, because I'd put 200 on them as a temporary number that I'd change later when I assigned them to a specific slot. So 200 was viewed at the time as being a far-off future number that we weren't even close to hitting yet. Today, I use 900 as a temporary number on scripts that are in development. I also can tell from cues in the scripts that we hadn't yet made the jump to do in video. At the time, on YouTube, we were just playing the audio version of the podcast with a static image over it. And I think we made the jump to video something like around episode 54 or something like that. So these would have been written before that. So I've wanted to do this episode for a long time, and the basic reason is that it's a fascinating true crime story. Uh, the Zodiac is the most famous solo serial killer in American history. Jack the Ripper is more famous, but he wasn't active in America. Charles Manson is more famous, but he didn't act by himself. So Zodiac is unique in the history of American crime, and he has a really interesting story that I've read a lot about. In fact, as with Manson, I've read multiple books on the Zodiac from multiple perspectives. So how will we be looking at this mystery? Well, for a start, uh, I promise we will not be trying to make this super scary. There are a lot of things we could do, like some other podcasts, like going into a lot of gory detail and using scary music to make it super scary. But we will not be doing those things. We will be doing the opposite. We are going to be talking about murders, but we're going to keep things clinical and only say things like Zodiac killed this person with this weapon, not giving you a blow-by-blow -blow account. Also in this episode, we'll be covering his major crimes. So in this episode, so next episode should be even less scary than this one, but parent, parents should still exercise discretion when making decisions for their families. And what's the overall structure for the series we'll be doing on the Zodiac? He's famous not just for the crimes that he's known to have committed, but also for having an extensive literary career where he wrote cards and letters to newspapers, taunting the police to catch him and send in ciphers for people to try to decode. So today we'll be looking primarily at the canonical crimes and then next week we'll look more at his literary career. Then we'll take a break from talking about the Zodiac because I don't want to do a Zodiac month on the show. Eventually, we'll come back and do a third episode on Zodiac's undiscovered early career because in committing the officially recognized crimes, he displayed a lot of criminal sophistication, which points to him having an earlier career. And we've got a pretty good idea what some of his early crimes were. Then finally, we'll do a fourth part where we look at the suspects for who Zodiac may have been and see what we can conclude about him. So we're doing a two-part look at Zodiac's crimes and literary career now, and at some point in the future, we'll look, about, we'll look at his early career and at the suspects. Let's talk about the sources that are available on the Zodiac case. How reliable are they and which ones did you use? 
given how famous the case is, there are lots of books, websites, documentaries, and videos about the Zodiac, but most of them are of pretty poor quality and not to be relied upon. The most famous books are by a man named Robert Graysmith. What can you tell us about them? Robert Graysmith is the pen name of Robert Gray Smith, who was a political cartoonist for the San Francisco Chronicle before he became a true crime writer. When he became the latter, he smushed his middle name Gray and his last name Smith together to become Robert Graysmith. In 1986, he released a book called Zodiac. It was the first major book on the subject, and it became a national bestseller. In 2002, he released a new updated book about the case called Zodiac Unmasked, in which he identified his favorite suspect for the killer by name. In the first book, he'd used a pseudonym for this person. Grace Smith's book then became the basis for the 2007 movie Zodiac, directed by David Fincher and starring Jake Gyllenhaal, Mark Ruffalo, and Robert Downey Jr. It's a well-made movie, but like any movie, it's fictionalized. So 2007 Zodiac movie should not be relied upon as a factual source. The website ZodiacKiller.com estimates it's only about 35% accurate. Grace Smith's books have been criticized as well. I haven't been able to determine how much of the criticism is justified and how much is due to the common jealousies and rivalries that happen in true crime discussion circles. But I've read both of his books, and my impression is that the criticism is at least partially warranted, particularly in sections that are more speculative. What are the best books on the Zodiac case that you found? The very best ones that I've found are a three-volume work that came out in 2020 by Michael Cole. The books are called Zodiac Revisited. Volume 1 deals with the facts of the case. Volume 2 offers analysis and fact-based speculation. And Volume 3 tries to summarize and tie everything together. I've read all three books, and they're really well done. When did the Zodiac Killer first come to public attention? He wasn't yet called the Zodiac. He was just an anonymous killer. But it was on December 20th, 1968. So this is the year before the Manson family's Tate LaBianca murders, which happened in August of 69. We talked about the Manson family back in episode 40. So you can go to mysterious.fm slash 54 and hear about those. And we weren't yet doing video at that time. It was a bit after that. Basically, Zodiac and the Manson family were both active in California at the same time, with Zodiac active in Northern California and the Manson family active in Southern California. But Zodiac got his public start before the Manson family had theirs. The town where the first of the canonical Zodiac crime ha crimes happened was Benicia, uh, California. Benicia is a town in the North Bay area, just above San Francisco. It's right next to another town called Vallejo. And Zodiac's first two victims were actually from Vallejo, but they had driven to an area that, according to some reports, was inside the Benicia city limits. The site was a roadside turnout uh, next to the Benicia pumping station on Lake Herman Road. The victims were a couple of teenagers named David Faraday and Betty Lou Jensen, and they were on a date. They told their parents that they were going to be going to a concert, but instead they went to Lake Herman Road, where the pumping station turnout was used as a lover's lane area. While they were there, the then-anonymous killer drove up, tried to force them out of their car, and shot them. At the time, nobody knew why they were killed. It just seemed random. When was the anonymous killer's next crime? It occurred over six months later on July 4th, 1969, and this time he struck in Vallejo itself. The victims were Darlene Farron, a 22-year-old married woman, though she still dated other guys, and the other was a 19-year-old Michael Majot, and he was the other victim. Uh, the two of them had gone out in part to get some fireworks for a 4th of July party they would be having once Darlene's husband got home. But Darlene said she needed to talk to Mike about something, and they stopped in a parking lot of a nearby park called Blue Rock Springs. While they were there, a car pulled up behind them and sat there for a minute. Mike asked Darlene if she knew who the driver of the other car was, and she said, oh, never mind. So it's not clear if she did know the other driver or if she just wanted Michael to ignore the other driver so that they could continue their conversation. The other car went away, but about five minutes later it returned. 
The driver got out and approached Darlene's 1963 Corvair from the passenger's side. He then proceeded to shoot Darlene and Mike. Darlene would die, but Mike would survive, which is how we know all this. Mike is still alive today. After committing the crime, the killer went to a payphone less than a mile from the Vallejo police station where he placed a call to the police switchboard operator. I want to report a double murder. If you go one mile east on Columbus Parkway to the public park, you will find the kids in a brown car. They were shot with a 9 millimeter Luger. I also killed those kids last year. Goodbye. So the killer placed a call to announce himself and taunt the police, something that would become a regular thing for him. He also took credit for having killed David Faraday and Betty Lou Jensen the previous December. The previous crimes had been committed uh, four miles away from the new one, so now the community knew that they had a serial killer in their midst, and they were terrified. At the end of the month, on Thursday, July 31st, 1969, the anonymous killer sent three letters simultaneously to three Bay Area newspapers, the Vallejo Times-Herald, uh, the San Francisco Chronicle, and the San Francisco Examiner. The contents of the letters were virtually identical. The letter contained in, oh, the letter also contained an unusual number of misspellings, which I've left intact, and some of them would affect pronunciation, so you may hear some words pronounced funny. Dear Editor, This is the murderer of the two teenagers last Christmas at Lake Herman, plus the girl on the 4th of July near the golf course in Vallejo. To prove I killed them, I shall state some facts which only I, plus the police, know. Christmas. One. Brand name of ammo, Super X. Two, ten shots were fired. Three, the boy was on his back with his feet to the car. Four, the girl was on her right side, feet to the west. Fourth July. One, girl was wearing patterned slacks. Two, the boy was also shot in the knee. Three, brand name of ammo was Western. Here is part of a cipher. The other two parts of this cipher are being mailed to the editors of the Vallejo Times plus SF Examiner. I want you to print this cipher on the front page of your paper. In this cipher is my identity. If you do not print this cipher by the afternoon of Fry, 1st of Aug, 69, I will go on a kill rampage, Fry, night. I will cruise around all weekend, killing lone people in the night, then move on to kill again, until I end up with a dozen people over the weekend. At the bottom of the letter was a strange symbol, which was basically a circle with a plus sign superimposed over it. It looked kind of, but not exactly like the targeted pattern that you see looking down a rifle scope. This circle plus targeting pattern is known as a reticule, and it is similar to the killer's symbol. This was the first time that the killer had used this symbol, and he had not yet given himself a name. What about the cipher he included? This was indeed in three parts, and each newspaper got one part of it. The cipher contained familiar letters from the alphabet, but it also contained backwards and upside down letters and unusual geometrical symbols. We'll have a picture of it in this episode's artwork so you can see the kinds of symbols for yourself. When put together, the three parts of the cryptogram w were 408 characters in length, so it's called the Zodiac 408 or Z408 cryptogram. These characters were lined up in neat, even columns, and when it was decoded, it again contained numerous misspellings and said, I like killing people because it is so much fun. 
it is more fun than killing wild game in the forest because man is the most dangerous animal of all. To kill something gives me the most thrilling experience. <laughs> it's even better than getting your rocks off with a girl. The best part of it is that when I die, I will be reborn in paradise. And all that I have killed will become my slaves. I will not give you my name because you will try to slow down or stop my collecting of slaves for my afterlife. At the end of this was a meaningless string of letters. Since the killer had said that the crypto cryptogram would contain his identity, meaning his identity, uh, some thought these meaningless letters might be a second embedded code that contained his name. However, it's more likely that they were just included to fill up the end of the message so that it would line up in neat, even columns and you wouldn't know where the actual end of the message was unless you successfully decoded it. It's also been suggested that the killer was having a bit of a joke here. By describing his motives, he did tell his identity as a killer in the sense of what motivated him, but he wouldn't reveal his name as it would slow down or stop his collecting of slaves for the afterlife. When was the 408 code cracked? Quite quickly. Uh, the newspapers didn't all publish the cipher immediately. They didn't publish it on their front pages, and the anonymous killer failed to go on the kill rampage that he threatened. But the complete code was finally published on August 3rd, three days after it was received, and people all over the Bay Area started working on it. The couple that was successful lived in Salinas, California. They consisted of a high school teacher named Donald Harden and his wife, Betty. They, and they worked on it off and on for about 20 hours. In his book, Sighting In on the Zodiac Killer, author Drew Beeson explains, Operating under the hunch that the author was egotistical, they determined that the first letter in the cipher would be I, so Don plugged in I all the way through. They also determined that somewhere in the cipher must be the word kill, so he looked for double symbols coming after the letter I, then he plugged in the letter L throughout the cipher. After doing this, he found that the code started falling apart and he decoded the message. Donald and his wife had successfully broken the code with the exception of the last 18 letters. However, the anonymous killer himself seems to be concerned that the Hardens had made a slight mistake in their version, and it appears that, right under the handle Concerned Citizen, he also sent a decoded version of the cipher to the police. Concerned Citizen wrote, Dear Sergeant Lynch, I hope the enclosed key will prove to be beneficial to you in connection with the cipher letter writer. Working puzzles, cryptograms, and word puzzles is one of my pleasures. Please forgive the absence of my signature or name, as I do not wish to have my name in the papers, and it could be mentioned by a slip of the tongue. With best wishes, concerned citizen. Drew Beeson comments, It would be very odd for the Hardens to have sent in another key for the cipher, asking to remain anonymous, since their names had already been published in the newspaper. It is my belief that the killer is the concerned citizen, and feeling embarrassed, he mailed the card and key in an attempt to take away some glory from the Hardens, who had solved his cipher so quickly. Another reason I feel that the killer sent in the second key was that his solution was the true solution. It was slightly different from the Harden solution. And this seems plausible to me. Did the anonymous killer really believe that by killing people, he was collecting slaves for the afterlife? Nobody knows, and it's a matter of debate. Uh, you could take him at face value and suppose that he was delusional and thought this was what was really happening, kind of like uh, Emperor Giorgio in Star Trek Discovery. Um, but you could also think that he was just lying and that he was laying the groundwork for an insanity defense in case he was ever caught. Would such a defense have worked? No, uh, not in general and certainly not in the state of California. In order for the insanity defense to work, you have to show evidence that a person did not realize 
that his crimes were considered wrong by society. Otherwise, every criminal could get off scot-free by just claiming he was insane at the time. As a result, if a person tries to conceal his crimes in some way, it's evidence that he knew society considered them to be wrong, and thus he was not insane in the legal sense of the term. The anonymous killer knew that society considered his crimes wrong, which is why he wouldn't reveal his name, and so he wouldn't have counted as insane in the legal sense of the term. Thus, this cryptogram would actually have provided evidence that he was legally sane since he didn't want his name to be known. But the anonymous killer may not have known that. On the other hand, you know, perhaps he really believed this stuff. What was the reaction to the letter after it was received? Even though the anonymous killer included some details that theoretically were known only to him and the police, there was skepticism about whether it really came from the killer. Vallejo Police Chief Jack Stiltz argued that someone might have come into possession of the information that was in the letter, and in the newspaper, he urged the killer to provide additional details to prove his identity. As a result, on, on August 4th, 1969, the killer sent a new three-page letter to the San Francisco Examiner. Dear Editor, this is the Zodiac speaking. In answer to your asking for more details about the good times I have had in Vallejo, I shall be very happy to supply even more material. By the way, are the police having a good time with the code? If not, tell them to cheer up. When they do crack it, they will have me. On the 4th of July, I did not open the car door. The window was rolled down already. The boy was originally sitting in the front seat when I began firing. When I fired the first shot at his head, he leaped backwards at the same time, thus spoiling my aim. He ended up on the back seat, then the floor in the back, thrashing out very violently with his legs. That's how I shot him in the knee. I did not leave the scene of the killing with squealing tires plus racing engine as described in the Vallejo paper. I drove away quite slowly so as not to draw attention to my car. The man who told the police that my care was brown was a Negro, about 40-45, rather shabbily dressed, I was at this phone booth having some fun with the Vallejo cops when he was walking by. When I hung the phone up, the damn X at sign thing began to ring, plus that drew his attention to me, plus my car. Last Christmas, in that episode, the police were wondering as how I could shoot, plus hit my victims in the dark. They did not openly state this, but implied this by saying it was a well-lit night. Plus, I could see the silhouettes on the horizon. Bull That area is surrounded by high hills plus trees. What I did was tape a small pencil flashlight to the barrel of my gun. If you notice, in the center of the beam of light, if you aim it at a wall or ceiling, you will see a black or dark spot in the center of the circle of light, approx three to six inch across. When taped to a gun barrel, the bullet will strike exactly in the center of the black dot in the light. All I had to do was spray them as if it was a water hose. There was no need to use the gun sights. I was not happy to see that I did not get front page coverage. At the end of this was the circle with the plus sign superimposed symbol that and the words no address. This letter is noteworthy in several respects. First, the killer gives himself a name. Uh, he had signed previous letters with the circle and plus sign, but now he opens with the line, this is the Zodiac speaking, which would become standard in future communications. Also note that he calls himself the Zodiac instead of just Zodiac. The press would frequently refer to him as Zodiac, but he preferred the Zodiac, kind of like the Batman instead of Batman. 
So at last, the anonymous killer had a name of sorts. Also, this name shed new light on the symbol that he used to close his letters. The zodiac is a circle of constellations in the plane of the ecliptic, which is the plane that the Earth orbits around the sun in. The sun passes through each of the constellations of the zodiac as Earth orbits around the sun every year. And the Earth's orbit is divided into four segments by the spring and autumnal equinoxes and the winter and summer solstices. That annual orbit with four divisions could be another interpretation of the zodiac's signature symbol of a circle with a plus sign superimposed on it. What else is notable about the letter? The Zodiac responds to some of the claims made in the newspapers of the time, such as that he fled the Blue Rock Springs site with squealing tires. He says that's not true, that he drove away from the location slowly so as not to attract attention. Also, he says he used a specially modified gun with a pencil flashlight taped to the barrel so that he only had to point it towards the victims and fire without having to aim carefully since the center of the flashlight beam showed him where the bullet would go. He also revealed something that happened after his phone call to the Vallejo police that had not been previously known. After he hung up the phone, the police switchboard operator had called the number back, causing the public payphone to ring, and they knew that part. But what they didn't know is that this attracted the attention of a black man who saw Zodiac at the phone booth. That meant that there was an additional witness who saw him. Unfortunately, this witness was never found, and so it didn't result in any promising leads. Finally, the Zodiac wasn't happy that he hadn't been receiving front-page coverage in the newspapers. This shows how invested he was and how hungry he was for front-page coverage. The same thing is also revealed by the fact he was closely following the coverage in the local papers and wanted to respond to claims made about him, like that he had driven away with squealing tires. He was obsessed with the press coverage about him, which is why he wrote back just one day after the full cipher had been published and Chief Stilts had asked him to provide further information. Now, before we continue on, we want to stop here and take a moment to thank our patrons who make this show possible, including Dr. P, Craig H, John Z, Jeff F, and Danielle H. Their generous donations at sqpn.com slash give Make it possible for us to continue Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World and all the shows at StarQuest. And you can join them by visiting sqpn.com slash give. Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World is also brought to you by DeliverContacts.com, offering top brand contact lenses at always low prices with free delivery. Visit DeliverContacts.com and buy... Great Lakes Customs Law, helping importers and individuals with seizures, penalties, and compliance with U.S. Customs matters throughout the United States. Visit GreatLakesCustomsLaw.com. Jimmy, the letter we just covered was sent on August 4th, 1969. What was the next event in the story of the Zodiac? It took place nearly two months later on September 27, 1969, and once again, it involved two young people. This time, there were a couple of college students named Cecilia Shepard and Brian Hartnell. They had gone out to a reservoir named Lake Berryessa in Napa County, and they were laying on a blanket, enjoying the scenery on a Sunday afternoon. They heard some rustling, and Cecilia said she saw a man watching them. The man stepped behind a tree, and when he came out again, he had a gun. But that wasn't all. He was now wearing a bizarre costume. In Zodiac Revisited, Michael Cole describes it like this. His head was completely covered with an executioner-style hood. The top of the hood looked flat and had four corners, similar to the way a paper grocery bag would look if it were turned upside down. The cloth of the hood extended down nearly to the man's waist in both the front and back. Neatly embroidered on the chest area was a concentric cross and circle, with the circle being about three inches in diameter. Although not recognized by Brian or Cecilia at the time, this symbol, of course, was the zodiac symbol. The eye openings of the hood were covered by clip-on sunglasses, which obstructed their view of the assailant's eyes. 
The man in the hood told them not to be afraid. He said that he was an escaped convict on his way to Mexico, and he needed their money and Brian's car, which was a Volkswagen Carmen Ghia that was parked nearby. Brian only had 75 cents with him, and he eventually tossed his wallet and car keys toward the man. The man then said he needed to tie up Cecilia and Brian, and he tossed them some pre-cut plastic clothesline. He had Cecilia tie up Brian first, which she tried to do very loosely so that Brian could get his hands free. Unfortunately, after the man tied Cecilia up, he went back and tightened the knots that were holding Brian. Then, instead of using the gun he had with him, the man took out a knife and proceeded to stab both of the young people. After this, he left, but before he got in his own car and drove off, he wrote a message in magic marker on the door of Brian's Carmen Ghia. At the top of it was the circle with a plus zodiac symbol, and underneath it said, Vallejo, 12, 20, 68, 7, 4, 69, September 27, 69, 6.30, by knife. Vallejo was the location of the first two crimes, and the numbers in the message were the dates of all three crimes, and by knife was the most recent method of attack, guns having been used in the previous two. The killer was thus claiming responsibility for all three attacks. Zodiac then drove off, and once again, he, made a pay- he found a payphone and made a call to the police. Double murder. They are two miles north of Park headquarters. They were in a white Volkswagen Carmen Ghia. Where are you now? I'm the one who did it. The officer then heard the sound of the receiver being put down, but not hung up. So Zodiac was learning. That prevented the police from ringing the payphone back the way they did on the previous occasion. So the killer was learning as he went along. A local newspaper, uh, a local news director, though, was monitoring a police scanner and was able to quickly find the phone booth with the receiver off the hook because that identified it. And afterwards, the police were able to get 35 latent prints, including a palm print. Some of the prints were so fresh that they still had beads of moisture on them. What about Cecilia and Brian? Back by the lakeside, Cecilia and Brian were still alive. They managed to get out of their bonds, and Brian started crawling towards the road to get help. A passing fisherman on the lake also saw them and summoned the park rangers. It took a long time, but eventually they got an ambulance out to the remote location and whisked the students to a hospital and got them into surgery. Both of them had been conscious and able to describe what happened. They described their attacker as being about six feet tall and husky, They said that they could see that he had brown hair, which peeked through the eye slits of his hood, despite the fact he was wearing sunglasses. Unfortunately, after surgery, Cecilia would not survive her wounds, but Brian did and is still alive today. Later, police investigation of the crime scene indicated that the attacker wore size 10.5 wing walker shoes, a type of shoe that was used in the Air Force that had anti-static soles so you could walk on the wings of airplanes. That led to a theory that the Zodiac might have had a military background, but wing walkers were also sold to civilians at military surplus stores. Based on the depth of his footprints in the ground, the police also determined that the killer likely weighed between 200 and 225 pounds. Did he send a letter to the newspapers after this attack? No, but he did something else that ratcheted up the fear level in the area. Thus far, all of his attacks had been found outside of San Francisco itself, up in Vallejo and Napa County. But on Saturday, October 11th, 1969, just two weeks after the Lake Berryessa attack, he struck in San Francisco itself. Around 9.30 p.m., a cab driver named Paul Stein picked up a man at the intersection of Mason and Geary Streets. The man wanted to be taken to the corner of Washington and Cherry Streets, but when he got there, the man instructed Paul to drive one block further. The man then shot Paul Stein. Afterwards, he got out of the cab and started wiping it down. However, three young people, ages 16, 12, and 8, looked down out of a third-floor window of a house across the street. 
They saw him doing this and called the police. When the man was finished wiping down the cab, he started to walk away. Meanwhile, the police were speeding to the scene, but there had been a tragic miscommunication. Somehow, they had been told that they were looking for an NMA, or Negro Male Adult, instead of a Caucasian male adult. And the officers heading to the scene actually saw, and according to some accounts, stopped and talked to the Zodiac, but they didn't know he was who they were looking for. Once they got to the scene, they found that they should have been looking for a white guy, but by that point, the Zodiac was gone. A ma- they did a massive search of the area, which included the Presidio, which is a kind of military fort from the founding of the city, um, but they didn't get him. What did the police discover once they had a chance to analyze the crime scene? They discovered that someone, perhaps the killer, had left a pair of size 7 men's black leather gloves on the back seat. And size 7 is a rather small size for a man. They also got 30 fingerprints, one of which was the driver's, and some of which may have been from other passengers. But they found one print that contained traces of blood and was almost certainly left by the killer. They also found that the driver's keys and wallet were gone, as was a big part of his shirt. Since, uh, because of the witnesses, they were also able to get a police artist to do a sketch of the, sub- of the suspect, and they got another description of him. Michael Cole explains, The composite accompanied a physical description of the suspect. White male, 25 to 30 years old, 5 foot 8 to 5 foot 9 inches tall, and approximately 150 pounds. He was described as having reddish-brown hair, styled in a crew cut. Finally, the assailant was said to have been wearing heavy-rimmed glasses and a navy blue or black jacket. This differed from the description that they got from Lake Berryessa, which had the killer being three or four inches taller, quite a bit heavier, and with hair long enough to hang down through the eye holes of his hood though he easily could have gotten a haircut in the previous two weeks, so the last point isn't that significant. Also, the young people saw the man from across the street in the dark, so their estimates of his height and weight may not be very good. I don't know how good young people are at making such estimates at that distance in the dark. In fact, I don't know how good I myself would be at making them. After this, the people in San Francisco must have been terrified. They were, but what they didn't know and couldn't have known at the time is that we've now passed the apparent peak of Zodiac's activity. The Paul Stein murder is the last that the police are 100% certain was committed by the Zodiac. In the next few years, there are two more murders and an attempted murder that he very probably was responsible for, but the Zodiac was transitioning away from actively killing people to become more of a literary figure, playing games with the authorities through the mail and the newspapers. So the most violent part of our story is over. But the people of San Francisco had no way of knowing that. When did Zodiac next communicate with the newspapers? Just two days later, on October 13th, 1969, he sent a letter to the San Francisco Chronicle, and in it he included a piece of Paul Stein's shirt as proof. This is the Zodiac speaking. I am the murderer of the taxi driver over by Washington Street plus Maple Street last night. To prove this, here is a bloodstained piece of his shirt. I am the same man who did in the people in the North Bay area. The SF police could have caught me last night if they had searched the park properly instead of holding road races with their motorcycles seeing who could make the most noise. The car drivers should have just parked their cars, plus sat there quietly waiting for me to come out of cover. (laughs) School children make good targets. I think I shall wipe out a school bus some morning. Just shoot out the front tire, plus then pick off the kitties as they come bouncing out. Zodiac never did that, but the threat had to be taken seriously, and the city of San Francisco and officials of the uh, five Bay Area counties immediately took dramatic steps to protect school buses. At this point in our story, something really strange happened. On October 21st, 11 days after the Stein attack, 
An unknown man placed two calls to the Oakland Police Department claiming to be the Zodiac. What did he have to say? He said he wanted to discuss the possibility of his surrendering. Uh, he wanted the famous Boston defense attorney, F. Lee Bailey, to appear on a local call-in TV show called AM San Francisco, and he would call in to discuss surrendering. If they couldn't get F. Lee Bailey, he'd also accept Melvin Belli, who is a very famous San Francisco defense attorney, as well as the man who played the friendly angel Gorgon in the infamously awful 1968 Star Trek episode, And the Children Shall Lead. It turned out they couldn't get Bailey, but they did get Belly. Uh, a man who called himself Sam did call in and speak to Belly, and here's part of that exchange. Notice how, as a lawyer, Belly starts asking Sam about factors that could potentially exculpate him, like whether he ever fell out of a tree and thus might have injured his head. That's Jim. Jim said, well, maybe he's afraid of being beaten up or something like that now. Um, what, 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 what can I say? Well, why don't we just ask Sam to tell us a little bit more about what he's feeling right now. What are, tell us about uh, your, your feelings, Sam. You know, just tell us anything you want to. And then we'll come back and I'll give you a specific answer to this question that you're going to the gas chamber. Uh, stay with us so I can answer that for you. But uh, w w will you uh, attend on Jim just a minute and tell me, tell him that, what you're feeling or, or talk to us? Just tell us what's going on in, in, inside you right now, Sam. Please. I have headache. Right. How long have you had those headaches, said Sam? In a long time? Since I killed a kid. What? Was it before December that you had the headaches? Yes. Did, were you in service that you might have had uh, an injury in service? Did you ever fall out of a tree or downstairs? Were you ever unconscious? I don't know. It doesn't mm -hmm. matter. Does aspirin do you any good? No. Doesn't do any good. Sam, that yeah. stuff never did really good. <laughs> what I had headaches. Sam, let me ask you a question. Did you, I, did you attempt to call this program one other time when Mr. Belli was with us? And you called? Did you try to call us one other time, about two, two or three weeks ago, when, when Mel Belli was with us? Yeah. And you, and, well, and you couldn't get through. And couldn't get through. The phones were tied up. Was that it? Yeah. Sam, let, let me ask you this. There's some reason why you go to a particular doctor or a particular priest, and some reason why apparently you, you uh, wanted to talk to, to me or Lee. Is it that you feel that we have compassion for people who get in trouble? Or is it you feel that uh, we can do something for you? Or is it you feel that uh, we we're, uh, have enough integrity that if we promise you something, that uh, we're going to stick to it? Well, let's find out what, what, why he wanted to talk to Why did you want to talk to Mr. Belli, Sam? I don't want to be hurt. If, if it all boils down to the question of you're giving yourself up, if you could be assured that you wouldn't get capital punishment for my I don't son. Want to give my huh? so I want to kill those kids. Off the air, Belly and Sam arranged to have a meet-in later that morning at St. Vincent de Paul's thrift shop. Belly showed up, but Sam didn't. Do people think that this was the real Zodiac calling in? No. Michael Cole explains. The SFPD gathered together the three people who had previously heard the actual voice of the killer, namely Nancy Slover, the Vallejo PD switchboard operator, David Slate, the Napa PD officer who'd been manning the Napa switchboard when the Zodiac called, and Brian Hartnell, the Lake Berryessa survivor. All three listened to the audio tape with various clips being played multiple times. The conclusion was unanimous. The person who called the show was not the Zodiac. Not only were the audible characteristics of the voice wrong, but the manner in which the Zodiac spoke exhibited a confidence and maturity that Sam simply lacked. The Zodiac also confirmed that it wasn't him, though we wouldn't know that for decades, and we'll get back to that. On Saturday, November 8th, the Zodiac mailed a card, a greeting card, to the Chronicle. It's now called the Drip and Pen card because the front of the card features a wet fountain pen that's been hung up to dry. The text on the front of the card reads, Sorry I haven't written, but I just washed my pen. And when you open the card, the text says, and I can't do a thing with it. Wasn't that a reference to an old ad campaign? Yeah, it was for a product called Twice as Nice that combined shampoo and conditioner in one bottle. 
The catchphrase for the TV commercials was a woman saying, I just washed my hair and I can't do a thing with it, at which point someone would start talking about the benefits of Twice as Nice. We are going. We're not. We are going. We're not. Why not? I just washed my hair and I can't do a thing with it. Now you Twice as nice shampoo from Lever Brothers. It's shampoo and conditioner in one. Look, we washed half this girl's hair with plain shampoo, the other half with twice as nice. Plain shampoo can leave it snarly, hard to comb, not twice as nice. Plain shampoo can leave it frizzy, hard to manage, not twice as nice. I just washed my hair, and I can do a thing with it. Now you can do a thing with your hair. New Twice as Nice, shampoo and conditioner in one. The commercial was all over the airwaves at the time. I even remember it from when I was growing up in the early 1970s. So somebody at a greeting card company decided to riff on it by making a greeting card that said, Sorry, I haven't written, but my I just washed my pen and I can't do a thing with it. Not much of a joke, but then the Zodiac had a thing for not really funny jokes, which actually seems to be what you get on most supposedly funny greeting cards. They're just not that funny. In any event, the Zodiac uh, bought and sent the card, and inside the card he wrote, This is the Zodiac speaking. I thought you would need a good laugh before you hear the bad news. You won't get the news for a while yet. P.S. Could you print this new cipher on your front page? I get awfully lonely when I am ignored. So lonely I could do my thing. (laughs) The Zodiac also included a new cipher. This one was 340 characters long, so it's called the Zodiac 340 or Z340 cipher. It remained uncracked until December of 2020, 51 years later. One of the reasons for that was that when he was putting it together, Zodiac made a mistake in the code that threw off the cipher meaning that it couldn't be fully decoded without figuring out and correcting what Zodiac did wrong. When the message was finally read, it said, I hope you're having lots of fun trying to catch me. That wasn't me on the TV show. Which brings up a point about me. I am not afraid of the gas chamber because it will send me to paradise all the sooner. Because I now have enough slaves to work for me. Where everyone else has nothing when they reach paradise. So they are afraid of death. I'm not afraid, because I know that my new life is life will be an easy one in paradise. Death. So Zodiac confirmed that it wasn't him on the TV show with Melvin Belli. And he went on to ramble about his slaves in paradise and how he's not afraid of death, though we'd have to wait another 51 years to hear that. Oh, and by the way, uh, they did eventually figure out who it was that had called Belly on the TV show. Apparently, it was a mental patient named Eric Weil, who they caught because he became obsessed with Belly and repeatedly called his home. Zodiac mailed his next letter almost immediately after the dripping pen card, and this one was much longer. What can you tell us about it? He mailed it the very next day on November 9th, 1969, and it was again sent to the Chronicle. It's known as the bus bomb letter, and it is quite lengthy, but also informative. It said, This is the Zodiac speaking. Up to the end of Oct, I have killed seven people. I have grown rather angry with the police for their telling lies about me. So I shall change the way, the collecting of slaves. I shall no longer announce to anyone. When I commit my murders, they shall look like routine robberies. Killings of anger and a few fake accidents, ETC. The police shall never catch me because I have been too clever for them. One, 
I look like the description passed out only when I do my thing. The rest of the time, I look entirely different. I shall not tell you what my disguise consists of when I kill. I shall not tell you what my disguise consists of when I kill. Two. As of yet, I have left no fingerprints behind me, contrary to what the police say. In my killings, I wear transparent fingertip guards. All it is is two coats of airplane cement coated on my fingertips. Quite unnoticeable, plus very effective. Three. My killing tools have been bought through the mail order outfits before the ban went into effect. Except one, and it was bought out of the state. So as you can see, the police don't have much to work on. If you wonder why I was wiping the cab down, I was leaving fake clues for the police to run all over town with. As one might say, I gave the cops some busy work to do to keep them happy. <laughs> I enjoy needling the blue pigs. Hey, blue pig, I was in the park. You were using fire trucks to mask the sound of your cruising prowl cars. The dogs never came within two blocks of me. Plus, they were to the west. Plus, there was only two groups of parking about ten men apart. Then the motor circles went by about 150 feet away, going from south to northwest. P.S. Two cops pulled a goof about three minutes after I left the cab. I was walking down the hill to the park when this cop car pulled up. Plus, one of them called me over. Plus asked if I saw anyone acting suspicious or strange in the last five to ten men. Plus I said, yes, there was this man who was running by waving a gun. And the cops peeled rubber, plus went around the corner as I directed them. Plus I disappeared into the park a block and a half away, never to be seen again. Hey, pig, doesn't it rile you up to have your nose rubbed and your boo-boos? <laughs> if you cops think I'm going to take on a bus the way I stated I was, you deserve to have holes in your heads. Take one bag of ammunition, nitrate fertilizer, plus one gal of stove oil, and dump a few bags of gravel on top. Plus then set the off. Plus, we'll positively ventilate anything that should be in the way of the blast. The death machine is already made. I would have sent you pictures, but you would be nasty enough to trace them back to developer, plus then to me. So I shall describe my masterpiece to you. The nice part of it is all the parts can be bought on the open market with no questions asked. One bat, pow clock, will run approx one year. One photoelectric switch. Two copper leaf springs. Two 6V car bat. One flash light bulb plus reflector. One mirror. Two 18-inch cardboard tubes black with shoe polish inside plus out. The next page then had a diagram of the bomb, after which the letter continued. The system checks out from one end to the other in my tests. What you do not know is whether the death machine is at the site or whether it is being stored in my basement for future use. I think you do not have the manpower to stop this one by continually searching the roadsides looking for this thing. Plus, it won't do to rewrote. Plus reschedule the buses, because the bomb can be adapted to new conditions. Have fun. To prove that I am the Zodiac, ask the Vallejo cop about my electric gun sight, which I used to start my collecting of slaves. He also included another piece of Paul Stein's shirt to prove who he was. The Zodiac said several things of note in this letter, like he would no longer announce his crimes, but make them look like... They'd been committed by other people or were accidents. What did people make of that? 
It created uncertainty about which deaths Zodiac was responsible for, and it set off a lot of speculation. However, most people today seem to think that he didn't really do this, and the claim was just made to inflate his own legend by making people think he was responsible for more deaths than he actually was. He did later take credit for more crimes, which some have taken as evidence that he didn't really follow through on this claim, but you can look at it more than one way, as we'll see. What about his claim that he wore a disguise when committing his crimes, as well as fingerprint guards? He did wear a disguise at Lake Berryessa. Uh, that was why he had the executioner's hood. On other occasions, he may have altered his appearance a little, but there's only so much you can do, especially if you have a crew cut, like he did when he killed Paul Stein, the cab driver. As to the fingerprint guards, this seems rather unlikely. Some of the prints that they recovered from a phone book or phone booth were so fresh that they still had sweat on them. And one of the prints from Paul Stein's cab had blood in the print. This seem, this comment that he wore finger, fingertip guards seems more like an attempt to throw off the police by making them think they didn't have prints when really they did. Dramatically, Zodiac said that he spoke to and misdirected two of the police officers who came to investigate the Paul Stein crime scene. What about this claim? The two officers definitely saw him, and now that they knew who he was, one of them provided a description of him as follows. The suspect that was observed by Officer Fook was a white male adult, 35 to 45 years, about 5 foot 10, 180 to 200 pounds, Medium heavy build, barrel chested, medium complexion, light colored hair, possibly graying in rear, may have been lighting that caused this effect. Crew cut, wearing glasses, dressed in dark blue waist length zipper type jacket, navy or royal blue. Elastic cuffs and waistband zipped part way up. Brown wool pants, pleated type, baggy in rear, rust brown. May have been wearing low cut shoes. Suspect at no time appeared to be in a hurry. Walked with a shuffling lope, slightly bent forward, head down. The subject's general appearance to classify him as a group would be that he might be of Welsh ancestry. I'm rather dubious of the ability to identify a man as having possible Welsh ancestry, especially when you see him only briefly at night by the streetlights on a tree-lined street. Welsh ancestry is rather specific to my mind. And what about the claim he spoke to and misdirected the officers? They denied that, and there's a debate in the community that studies the Zodiac crimes. Some think that the officers said they didn't talk to him and only saw him in order to take the sting out of having him let through the slip, having let him slip through their fingers. And some critics claim that there is additional evidence that points to them speaking to him, but I'm not aware of what that additional evidence might be. One of the notable things about the letter is that Zodiac announced a different plan for taking on a bus. Yeah, originally he'd said he'd shoot out a front tire and then shoot the kids as they came out of it. Now he was proposing to use an ammonium nitrate and fuel oil bomb, and that could happen. In 1995, Timothy McVeigh used such a bomb in his attack on the Alfred P. Murrah Federal Building in Oklahoma City, which we'll talk about in the future. And so people took this threat seriously, though people have pointed out that his design for the bomb isn't that great. And in a later letter, Zodiac would describe a new and improved version of the bomb. We're now coming up on the one-year anniversary of the Zodiac's first killings, David Faraday and Betty Lou Jensen. Did he do anything to commemorate this? He did. On December 20th, 1969, one year to the day after the first crime, he sent a letter to Melvin Belly. He sent this letter to Melvin Belly's home address, and on the envelope that contained the letter, the numbers of Belly's home address seem to have been written in the same style, the same font, if you will, that they appeared on Belly's house which suggests that Zodiac had seen the outside of Belly's house and seen him with his own eyes, which is rather creepy. Now, just because Sam, the man who called the TV show, didn't turn out to be the Zodiac, that doesn't mean that Zodiac wasn't the one who had requested that Belly come on the show. It could be that the real Zodiac tried to call the show but couldn't get through because Sam was hogging the line. 
In any event, the letter he sent to Melvin Belly could be evidence that the killer really did want to speak with Belly and want help. The letter said, Dear Melvin, this is the Zodiac speaking. I wish you a happy Christmas. The one thing I ask of you is this. Please help me. I cannot reach out for help because of this thing in me won't let me. I'm finding it extremely difficult to hold it in check. I'm afraid I'll lose control again. I take my ninth and possibly tenth victim. Please help me. I'm drowning. At the moment, the children are safe from the bomb because it's so massive to dig in. And the trigger mech requires much work to get it adjusted just right. If I hold back too long from now, I will lose all control of myself and set the bomb up. <gasps> Please help me. I cannot remain in control for much longer. To prove he was the real Zodiac writing, he included another piece of Paul Stein's shirt, so this was the real deal, not a phony Sam. Unfortunately, the letter was delayed in its arrival by the Christmas mail rush, and Belly wasn't home to receive it, but on his way to Europe. When a secretary opened it, they called him in Munich, West Germany, back when there was a West Germany, and he phoned up the Chronicle and made a statement. You have asked me for help, and I promise you I will do everything in my power to provide you with whatever help you may need or may want. Please write to me in care of the Chronicle and tell me how I may help. If you want to talk with me in person, I will meet with you anywhere at any time you designate. If you want to meet with me alone, I will come alone. If you want me to bring a priest or a psychiatrist or a reporter to talk with, I will do so. I will follow your instructions to the letter. You say you are losing control and may kill again. Do not make things worse. Let me help you now. I assure you the Chronicle will contact me immediately upon hearing from you and that we will keep this matter in strictest confidence. However, Zodiac never met with Belly, and there's speculation that the attorney did something to anger Zodiac because the next time he mentions Belly, his tone is nasty. It's been speculated that perhaps he got mad at Belly because Belly asked him to use an intermediary at the paper instead of speaking with him directly. An FBI memo records that someone claiming to be the Zodiac tried to call Belly's house just after this letter was sent, but Belly was over in Europe. It's been suggested that Belly's statement to the Chronicle is what annoyed him. Michael Cole explains... On December 30th, the Chronicle published an article that may well have rubbed the killer the wrong way. In it, Belli instructed the Zodiac to communicate with him via the Chronicle. In other words, the killer should telephone or write the newspaper, and a representative of the paper would pass the information along, supposedly in confidence, to Belli. Given that the killer had written Belli personally, phoned his residence, and possibly even visited the lawyer's home, the killer may have interpreted Belli's instruction to funnel communication through the Chronicle as a slight, a step backward that diminished the value of what the killer perceived to be an existing relationship. And this may be the case. In any event, the, the next time Zodiac mentioned Belly, he seems to have gone sour on the attorney. You mentioned that the Zodiac apparently attempted other murders and sometimes succeeded after the death of cab driver Paul Stein. What was the next one? The next incident took place on March 22, 1970. A woman named Kathleen Johns was driving up to visit her mother from Southern California, and she was passing through Modesto, about 90 minutes east of San Francisco. Kathleen was a young mother. She had her infant daughter with her in the car, and she was also seven months pregnant with her second child. At about 11 p.m., she noticed a car behind her. The driver was honking his horn and flashing his lights, trying to get her to pull over. At first, she didn't, but eventually she did, since she was driving an old car and thought the other driver might be trying to warn her of a mechanical problem. When she stopped, the driver got out, came up to her window, and said that her back wheel was wobbly. He offered to fix it for her. Over the next few minutes, he adjusted the lug nuts on her wheel, and she went back to driving. But something was seriously wrong with the car now. 
And when Kathleen investigated, she discovered that her wheel was dangerously loose with only two of the five lug nuts still on it. The other driver was still nearby, and he backed up and offered to drive her to an Arco gas station up ahead. She got her daughter, and they started driving to the station. Only the man didn't take her to the station. He kept going. In fact, he kept driving for nearly two hours and started taking them down back roads. At one point, he said, You know you're going to die. You know I'm going to kill you. And that's our cliffhanger for this episode. <laughs> Hold on, folks. We'll, we'll be back next week with the rest of it. But until then, Jimmy, what further resources can we provide to the viewers and listeners? We'll have links to all three of Michael Cole's uh, books, Zodiac Revisited, Volumes 1, 2, and 3. Also, Robert Graysmith's book, Zodiac, and his book, Zodiac Unmasked. Drew Beeson's book, Sighting In on the Zodiac Killer a link to the 2007 Zodiac film, and a documentary. This is the Zodiac speaking, as well as general information about Zodiac. We'll have a link to ZodiacKiller.com, one of the major websites on the case. Also, a timeline from History.com, and a video about the Kraken of the 340 cipher. All right, and now it's time to hear from you. What are your theories about the Zodiac Killer? Let us know by visiting sqpn.com or the Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World Facebook page, sending us an email to feedback at mysterious.fm, sending a tweet to at mys underscore world, visiting the StarQuest Discord community at sqpn.com slash discord, or calling our mysterious feedback line at 619-738-4515. That's 619-738-4515. Special thanks to Oasis Studio 7 for the video and animation work on this episode. Be sure, if you haven't uh, yet checked it out, to check out the uh, video version of the podcast at my YouTube channel, youtube.com slash Jimmy Aiken. And while you're there, help me grow the channel if you would. Uh, like, comment, and share the video. And be sure and subscribe and hit the bell notification so you're notified whenever I have a video. Thank you so much. I also want to thank Rob Mady for his voiceover work on this episode. And Jimmy, what's our next episode going to be about? Next week, we're going to be looking at the many messages that the Zodiac Killer went on to send to newspapers and the bizarre things he said and did in them. Folks, be sure to check out the Mysterious World bookstore at mysteriousworldstore.com for links to all the books and videos that Jimmy mentions in the show. Get your very own Mysterious World t-shirt, mug, and more in our merchandise shop at sqpn.com slash merch. You can find links to Jimmy's resources from our discussion on our show notes at mysterious.fm slash 329. And remember, to help us continue to produce the podcast, please visit sqpn.com slash give. Jimmy Yakin's Mysterious World is also brought to you in part by The Grady Group, a Catholic company bringing financial clarity to their clients across the United States using safe money options to produce reasonable rates of return for their clients. Learn more at GradyGroupInc.com. And by Rosary Army, featuring award-winning Catholic podcasts, rosary resources, videos, and the School of Mary online community, prayer, and learning platform. Learn how to make them, pray them, and give them away while growing in your faith at rosaryarmy.com and schoolofmary.com. Jimmy Aiken's Mysterious World is also brought to you in part through the generous support of Aaron Ferguson Electric and Automation, making connections for life for your automation and smart home needs in North and Central Florida at AaronV.com. Until next time, Jimmy Aiken, thank you for exploring with us our mysterious world. Thanks, Tom. And once again, I'm Dom Bettinelli. Thank you for listening to Jimmy Aiken's Mysterious World on StarQuest. <laughs>